Going inside the issues of our community, this is Local 12 Newsmakers. I started out really just babysitting in my home. Found out about 4C and started attending some classes there and found out that I could really do a lot more than just babysit. I could really make this a profession. Each week, about 12.5 million American children spend an average of 36 hours in some kind of child care setting, including about 1.7 million in family care arrangements. A study issued this past week found Ohio one of six states scoring zero in its protection of children in small family child care settings. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. 14% of the children of working mothers are placed in small family child care settings each day. The oversight of these settings is very uneven from state to state, which sparked the National Association for Child Care Resource and Referral Agencies to undertake a systematic study. That report, entitled Leaving Children to Chance, was issued this past week. The study identified 14 key health and safety educational standards and assigned values to each. The maximum score was 140. The average, excluding the states that scored zero, was 59. 15 states either do not license small family child care homes, do not conduct an inspection prior to issuing a license, or allow more than six children in a home before applying state regulations, which means that the children in these states are in child care settings in which the safety of the home is simply unknown. In this report, Oklahoma with 105 points, Wisconsin, Massachusetts, the Department of Defense and the District of Columbia ranked at the top. Many states, like Kentucky with 40 points, ranked in the middle. Kentucky was number 29. 15 states, including Ohio, scored zero. Ohio was ranked 52nd. 4C, which stands for Comprehensive Community Child Care, is the regional child care resource and referral agency responsible for providing information to parents and training for child care owners, operators, and teachers in 23 communities in Southwest Ohio and Northern Kentucky. To talk about this study, I am joined now by Elaine Ward, the Chief Operating Officer of 4C here in Cincinnati. Elaine, welcome to Newsmakers. Good morning. This is a big study and we're going to give people the links to, so how they can get to it and read it for themselves. Great. But um, obviously your agency, which is this, and I want to clarify this term, resource and referral agency. So you're referring parents to child care and helping them find it, but you're acting as a resource for the people who run these agencies and care for the children. So that's where that name comes that's from. That's correct. So how long has 4C been concerned about Ohio's lack of any regulation of these small family child care situations? Well, we've been concerned about it since 4C began 35 years ago. Um, but it's, and we've tried several times uh, over our 35 years to work with the legislature to um, have uh, the state license small family child care homes. Uh, now it looks like they're working on it. So we think there's a chance to really make a change in Ohio. Is this become a concern? nationwide. Is that why this study was done? What, what exactly sparked this study? Do you know? Well, the National Association that put out the study um, last year did a report on child care centers and Ohio ranked in the middle of the pack. They did the same kind of thing and they're really setting the bar um, for standards for young children. We've come to recognize that young children um, that critical brain development occurs before a child's three. Um, Eighty percent of bra brain development occurs then. It's a very important time for a vulnerable population. And where are children? Most um, women with children under five are in the workforce. So childcare is critically important to our country. And this relates to a lot of local initiatives initiatives like Strive, yes. where we're trying in this community to recognize the importance of that very young child and that very young development that takes place. And so what, th what this report's saying is you can't really monitor it if you don't know what's going on. That's right. There has to be some basic health and safety standards 
in place and some very basic minimum oversight um, by the state so that parents can have some assurance that just that there's some sort of ground level of requirement being met when they choose care. I want to use the, our two states, Kentucky and Ohio, as examples here. So I pulled these parts of the report and uh, just to look at, um, ex for example, what is being said about Kentucky, they point out the strengths of what happens with uh, Kentucky, and I want to read one of these. Providers are required to communicate with parents about the care of their children, have a contract with parents, allow parents to access their homes at all times, and have written policies for parents. Now, I find that somewhat amazing, the idea that a child care provider might not provide access to the place where the child is. I mean, is that what that's saying? Is that the sort of that, regulation you're looking for? That's right. That is the sort of regulation we're looking for, so that if your child's in care, that you have the right to stop by at any time and expect to find the door open to you. And are there places where that doesn't happen? That's correct. Okay. And then they also, in each state, point out weaknesses. And in the state of Kentucky, um, a couple of weaknesses. One, allow providers to care for at least four children for pay without being licensed. What does this report, what does your type of agency think should happen here? Where, where should licensing start? Well, um, the report, the national report, really is, they're looking at studies from the American Academy of Pediatrics and the um, U.S. Department of Health and um, Child Health and making recommendations that basically when someone is providing care in their own residence um, for an unrelated child for pay, they are a small business and at that point they should be regulated. So even one um, child? That's basically um, what they're saying. That sets the bar very high. Um, Ohio, in Ohio has no regulation at right. all we'll presently, get to Ohio in a minute. but in Kentucky they, they say that if you're caring for four um, children. Beyond your own. Beyond your own. Um, that is the threshold where you become licensed. And so they, uh, Kentucky um, scored where they did because they should probably lower that okay. a little bit. Here's another one in Kentucky, a weakness that they're suggesting a change, and I think it just illustrates what we're really talking about here. Kentucky does not conduct a background check using fingerprints and also does not check juvenile records or sex offender registries. Uh, yes, and the interesting thing about that is, uh, you know, Kentucky does do a criminal background check, um, but what we've learned is that the um, FBI fingerprint check is really the one that will be comprehensive and um, truly find out um, whether someone has a criminal background. So it, it's just there's the depth of what it finds out that um, is better for safety. Now turning our attention to Ohio, I can point out that it's easy with the strengths and weaknesses to make this clear because the page is just sort of blank. <laughs> That's right. There isn't anything. I mean this is amazing. It's, I, oh, it, it's pretty scary when Ohio ends up zero and at the bottom of one of these rankings. That's right. Where do we stand in Ohio? We just simply don't have any legislation at all? We have no regulation for small family child care homes at all at present. And there's only um, six states in that situation. That's right. So we were not only, um, there were 15 states that scored zero, but we were in the bottom 10 um, because there's just absolutely no regulation. Now, a lot of people in Ohio will think, oh, I know my provider is, has a license. Um, there is a system that's very much like a license for, that serves low-income families, and it has many of the standards that are talked about in this study in place, but it is for people that accept the voucher for low-income eligible families, and it's not for every child. And so we are really concerned in Ohio that there's a lack of um, safety and equity for all children. Uh, right now there um, are two bills that have been introduced in the Ohio legislature. It, one is, um, has been spo sponsored by Senator Stivers and the other by Representative John Peterson. Mm -hmm. They propose to um, create a licensing system in Ohio that would bring us out of 
um, the bottom. And in fact, would go beyond, right now, Kentucky's way out ahead of us. They did this, put this system in place um, about 15 years ago. Um, Ohio um, could move to a similar system as Kentucky, one that would be a little bit better. Um, if it, these laws pass. If these laws pass. Well, I know you've been in Columbus uh, talking to legislators. Yes. Where do we stand on this? I mean, it's one thing to drop a bill. Right. And, you know, it's another thing, but what's the reality of the political situation? Uh, let's face it, there's a lot of anti-regulation sentiment over right. the last 15, 20 years, thinking we got too many regulations. Uh, what's the reality of where these bills stand? Well, they're not moving at the moment. Um, the Senate version of the bill has heard proponent testimony. Um, that, but otherwise, um, bef th that occurred before the recess over the holidays, and since the holidays, um, attention has not returned to either bill. So uh, we would like to see some movement on that. The anti-regulatory stance is certainly what has kept Ohio from having such regulation all these many years, and is why we're in the bottom 10. Um, when it comes to safety for young children in family child care. Um, I, I think that um, we have a great opportunity here. And regulation, um, we regulate a lot of things. We regulate dog groomers, um, manicurists, tattoo mm. artists. Restaurants have to have health and safety inspections. We don't just rely on us to assume that they're keeping the meat cold in the refrigerator or that you're your food handlers are, are doing things properly, we know that the government has put some basic health and safety standards in place. You know, I have to say, working in a newsroom, one of the things I did is I, I did a search for video that we might have of home uh, childcare uh, settings. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that the only time it comes up is when there's a problem, when some tragedy has occurred, That's right. some child has been mistreated, some child care worker has been exposed as having a criminal background right. or something. <laughs> I hate to say it, but that often is why regulation comes back, because we wait for some crisis to take place. And they have happened already. Children have died in family child care homes in Ohio. Some, uh, When I testified in the Senate in December, a couple came to testify about their child who died in a small family child care home where the provider really didn't have safe practices in terms of how the baby was put to sleep in the bed. Now the recommendation is that babies sleep on their backs and um, they did not follow safe practices and in that home, that family child care provider home, and a child died. These things happen. Uh, we don't want any more of them to happen. It's a very vulnerable population, and we think it's a shared responsibility of the state and parents to ensure safety for our youngest, most vulnerable um, children. You know, I saw in the recommendations, and we're almost out of time, but I saw in the recommendations, you know, making sure that people have training, and you were just mentioning, how to put children down so that we don't That's have right. SIDS incidents or we'll try to minimize that anyway or whatever. And you know, I saw that list, here we are, weak basic safety and health. I just like to read this. Only eight states meet, uh, okay. 32 states require safe sleep practices to reduce the likelihood of SIDS. More than half the states do not require family child care providers to follow universal health precautions related to handling blood and other bodily fluids. I mean, it's, you know, those are basic things. It gets pretty scary when you think those aren't being watched. And, and truthfully, many providers mean well, oh, um, yeah. but they don't know. Right. And I want people to be able to follow up on this. There are a couple of websites. For more information about 4C, you can go to their website at 4C, and it's a hyphen, Cinti, C-I-N-T-I dot O-R-G. C-I. C-I-N-C-I <laughs> dot O-R-G. There's a million ways to do that. And if you want the full report, you can go to www. 
dot n a c c r r a a dot org. But y you can check the 4C website and you get all this Absolutely. information and find out how to write your congressman or, or your legislators and get involved in this. Elaine, thank you for being here this morning and thank Glad you for the work of here. 4C. Stay tuned. An independent study issued this week raised questions about who really runs our community. After the break, I'll be joined by the author. Welcome back. The word democracy slips off American tongue so often, for many of us, it has no substantive meaning. The leading American revolutionaries in the 1770s and the authors of the Second American Constitution at the end of the 1780s thought democracy was a corruption of government. They tried to structure a republic. From the beginning, American political thinkers worried about the impact of an over-concentration of power with the wealthy which became aggravated with the Industrial Revolution and the creation of the modern corporation. Many voices in many different forms, sometimes called populism, sometimes progressivism, sometimes conservatism, sometimes liberalism, sometimes socialism, from many different perspectives, have repeatedly cried out about the corruptive power of concentrated wealth on democracy. A new study released this week entitled, Who Rules Cincinnati is in that spirit. That study reads, and I sort of as, as a thesis statement, finds that a handful of national and multinational corporations dominate the economic, social, and cultural life of the city, and that has led to a distorted development and a grotesque contrast between the rich and the poor. I am joined by the report's author, Dan Labatz, a self-styled activist scholar. Mr. Labatz grew up in Southern California where he became active as a volunteer with the United Farm Workers. He has worked as a steel worker, a truck driver, a founding member of the Teamsters for Democracy, and a journalist in the United States and Mexico. Mr. Labatz has written several books relating to labor reform movements and writes regularly in the United States and Mexico for publications such as Counterpunch, the New Labor Forum, Against the Current, and other journals. Labatz earned his PhD in history from UC and has taught as an adjunct at NKU, UC, and Miami. He is active with Cincinnati Progressive Action, a local human rights organization, and focused particularly on issues of racism and the treatment of Im immigrants. Dan, welcome to uh, Newsmakers. Thanks for having me here, Dan. A couple of historians, a dangerous group. <laughs> um, you know, I, I read sort of what uh, an edited version of the, your your thesis statement mm -hmm. here is what you're talking about what you're observing in Cincinnati what you see in Cincinnati do you think it's any fundamentally any different than any other sort of mid-size <coughs> urban area I think it's probably common not only to um, Cincinnati and to many other mid-sized cities but it's common to large cities and it's a problem and an issue in the nation as a whole. I think that's why we can have somebody uh, like uh, John Edwards screaming in, about corporate power. We see in uh, statements from Barack Obama or from Huckabee uh, a populist message that people are uh, tired of the, this enormous power of the corporations, steering the country, making the decisions, uh, leading us uh, to environmental disaster, to war in Iraq. But I guess, I guess my, question, my question is, is Cincinnati any worse in, in your study? Or is it, are we a case study for what America is as a whole from your perspective? Yeah. Well, I didn't do a study of other cities. I didn't do a comparative study. Uh, I think Cincinnati is probably a case study okay. for the country as a whole, though I think Cincinnati is per perhaps particularly dominated by corporations um, because in this city uh, you have not had a powerful labor movement such as, for example, for many years existed in a city like Chicago because you don't have um, the tremendous uh, complexity and different social groups that exist in a city like New York or Los Angeles. This city has been simpler and so uh, six or seven big corporations have been able, I think, to exert more power than in other cities. One could also argue from another side, too, I would just throw in that a, a, something that's get pointed out a lot of times, that for a city our size, we have an abnormally high number 
of corporate headquarters, international corporate headquarters here, and or national corporate headquarters, but international as well. Uh, and consequently, you know, one could argue that although that's usually pointed out as something in our favor because it, uh, of the accumulation of wealth, it can be seen from another perspective. So strength on one side, weakness on another side, I think is what you're saying. When you say concentration, what are the corporations that you think are particularly uh, where the concentration really exists? Well, uh, Procter & Gamble has been the dominant force in this city for over 100 years. And uh, Procter & Gamble is without a doubt the most powerful corporation here. Um, but also Kroger's, Scripps, American Financial Group, which uh, is the Lindner Corporation, um, Macy's, which was federated uh, department stores. Those corporations uh, are the ones that one finds uh, are the wealthiest, they're the most powerful, but they're also the ones that you find then on the board of every important institution, university, museum, uh, social welfare organization, even uh, dominating the boards of an African American organization such as the Urban League. So these corporations become a network of control over many other institutions, well, let, certainly let, of influence, and let, I would argue control. Let's, let's be real about this, uh, speaking sort of from my museum perspective, mm -hmm. and I work for the Cincinnati Museum Center. Uh, the reason that those sorts of organizations have representatives of those corporations on their boards is because they need financial support. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's the, we also are very proud of our cultural strength in this city, whether it's the May Festival or the Symphony mm -hmm. or the Museum Center or whatever. So isn't this just the way things work in America. It's just the way Where things... Where we don't fund culture with, with tax dollars. We oppose it. Well, it's just the way things work in America, without a doubt. And I think that uh, and that's, that's the issue and that's the problem. And I think we could compare it with the way that in, uh, in some other nations, you do have government funding of the arts in a very broad way. Uh, in some countries, you have many more uh, voluntary and cooperative institutions, both in in that is cooperatives, worker-owned, consumer-owned organizations. But here, those organizations have been marginalized, squeezed out, crushed because they're a competitor in the free market model. I, I and we I know we have limited time, so I want to get to this. Just looking at the cultural organizations, the educational institutions. Mm -hmm. Why is it bad to have so much corporate? What what do you what do you see? You're not just describing something. You're describing something that you think has deleterious effects. What? What do you think is bad about that for those kinds of organizations? Well, I think what we have in this country is that corporations have a certain way of running themselves and, of, and historically of running the country. They are authoritarian organizations. They're out to make a profit. They push certain ideals around competitiveness and individualism. And those are ideals that squeeze out notions, for example, of cooperation and solidarity. So, and everywhere they go, they tend to bring their vision of society and their model of organization and the way they do things. And I'm saying that what that does is it shapes and limits the parameters uh, of expression and understanding. And so that today, I walk onto a university campus and there in giant letters is the name of some corporate executive or some corporation as the universities are being bought, over, bought up, taken over by these corporations. That's not a good thing, I don't think, for intellectual life, for cultural life. The other area that you're particularly interested in in this report is about impact on polit mm -hmm. local politics, mm -hmm. not presidential for the moment. Right. Local politics. What do you think the impact is on local politics? Well, I think the real impact is that, um, that we have before us uh, political parties and candidates and politicians that are coming and going and they're sort of, uh, they pass. The real power in Cincinnati is the corporate money that stands behind that. And these corporations give tens of thousands of dollars to the candidates that will be more conservative. They will support corporate interests. The corporate development plans, particularly important in this city, are these, uh, are these big corporate alliances like uh, CBC, 3CDC, DCI, these, uh, these, these institutions which have replaced pub democratic public decision-making bodies. I mean, you started out with democracy. 
We used to have a planning department. We don't have a planning department. That has been privatized and handed over to a group of corporations to plan our future. What could be a clearer violation of a principle of democracy? Yeah, yeah I remember a comment by Charlie Lucan when he was mayor of the first round. Mm -hmm. He created the Smail Commission. And the way he described it to me was, well, government has been so beaten down and the argument that government is evil has been so beaten down that to do anything you need to bring the corporate world in. You have to borrow their credibility. That's how he termed it. We have to borrow their credibility because government knew that the streets were falling apart, mm -hmm. but if it said it, it wouldn't have any authority. Only the corporations are believed. Well, I think, though, that maybe today that's not going to be the case. I mean, the corporations, I don't think, are going to be believed today. Uh, at, the big, at the big picture, global warning, global warming uh, makes us wonder about corporate power. The war in Iraq makes us doubt the oil companies. I think corporate power is uh, questioned and challenged here. Okay, we've only scratched the surface. I want people to have a chance to read this. If you would like to read the entire report for yourself, check out the website at www.cincinnatistudies.org. Okay, thank you for being here, Dan, and thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Next week, we begin pre preparation for the March primaries and the continuing effort to improve the, the care of children who need foster care. Have a good week. <laughs>